I'd like to get started with an introduction um, about Dr. Muser. Um, you know, as everybody knows, I'm the Associate Dean of Research, and my main job is to help students develop projects and research and scholarship. And we are live streaming this um, event. So it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Tom Muser. Tom joined us uh, September 2018. That was actually the same date I joined UNI. Um, he's a professor of social work at the Westburg College of Health Professionals. And he's the founding director of the new University Center for Excellence in Aging and Health. Um, Tom has amazing academic credentials. He's a clinical psychologist with experience in narrative um, gerontology, neuropsychology of um, dementing disorders, and so psychosocial intervention. He received both his master's and PhD with an emphasis on aging from the University of um, Missouri. So with that, I'll let Tom go on to speak about research. Thank <clears throat> Thanks, Carol. Everyone hear me OK? OK, good. So it's a pleasure to be here with all of you uh, on this lovely afternoon. Um, I opted to keep the windows open so we wouldn't feel like we were in a dungeon uh, today. So you can, everyone can see the slides OK, I, I assume. Good. Thank you. So um, I'm going to tell you some stories today. I'm also going to extend an invitation so our Center for Excellence in Aging and Health formed in fall of 2018. So we're a little over a year old, and we've made tremendous progress. Part of that has come from just the tremendous support and engagement of so many uh, folks here at UNE and in the community. I'm really humbled by that level of support. And I think as the talk progresses, you'll see why. So humbled and grateful. So I'm going to start with my main points, because sometimes it's helpful to actually have the takeaways at the beginning, because when you hear them at the end, you'll remember them. I have uh, an announcement about a visiting scholar who's coming, and I'm hoping many of you can uh, participate. And then we'll work through and talk about the Aging Center. Um, the picture that's on the screen is myself and Dr. Reggie Robnett. Um, Reggie is the second from the right. Reggie is the associate director for the Aging Center. She's an occupational therapist. Um, to the far right is our administrative assistant, Kelly. And the other two young women with flowers are MSW students who did their practicum at the Mother House at Baxter Woods, which I'll share about in a moment. So the punchlines uh, to begin and to end We've created a resource for student and faculty research. I'm going to tell you about the Legacy Scholars Program. We've formed a satellite office in a retirement community that can be something of a living laboratory for research on aging. I have developed strong linkages with two large representative longitudinal data sets in aging. They're also available to UNE students and faculty to utilize for both exploratory and hypothesis-driven research. And we've just issued a call for pilot proposals to our faculty for next academic year. I have extra paper copies uh, up here, and I'll tell you about that in a moment. Our visiting research scholar for 2019 is Dr. Dorothy Farrar Edwards. Dorothy is an experimental psychologist who spent actually much of her career working in rehabilitation. Uh, she's now actually in kinesiology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. But Dorothy is an academic jack of all trades. The term neuroscientist would fit with her just as well as any of these other labels. And she has really made her mark through her career in the study of cognitive aging and the intersection of daily life function in cognitive aging. So she's known in the Alzheimer's world. She's also known in the stroke world. Uh, she is an internationally recognized expert on executive dysfunction, so frontal lobe dysfunction in the brain. And I'm pleased to bring Dorothy here to share her and her expertise with the UNE community. This is the week after Thanksgiving. So come rested after eating your turkey and come visit with Dorothy. So she will be in this room two weeks from today speaking about some really interesting research on stroke and how early dysfunction predicts uh, the uh, pathways in, in stroke outcome. 
She's also going to be doing uh, a half-day kind of morning workshop on Alzheimer's disease research. So the Tuesday on the 3rd of December here in this room at noon, at noon and then um, Wednesday morning at 10 up on the Portland campus. These flyers are available on the online calendars. Uh, if you just type in her name, you'll turn it up. So I hope to see many of you at these events. So why Maine and aging? Most of you probably know that Maine is the oldest state by average population age. It's also a state that I think presents many of the, or represents many of the challenges that we're facing in aging across the country. A high proportion of our elders live in rural or semi-rural areas. Um, we have uh, many who are struggling with income issues, both below the federal poverty line, but also even if you're anywhere close to the federal poverty line, poverty line, you are struggling. We also have a high proportion of veterans among our senior population uh, here in Maine. Um, so Maine is a great place, I think, to study aging. And I think as a state, we have a lot to teach others around the country. A couple of issues, and this may be hard to see, but Maine is where the nation is going to be in 30 to 40 years. We have a higher proportion of our population in Maine over the age of 65 than under the age of 19 today. So you've probably heard the term squaring of the age pyramid. So if we go back a century, if you, if you looked at the numbers at different ages, you had a large number at the young ages, but it would taper because of uh, mortality and lifespan issues up to a point at the top. Well, today we're much more a pillar in terms of that age distribution across the United States. And in fact, Maine is starting to flip outward because we have the highest proportion of our population over the age of 65. And that presents challenges um, politically, economically, with respect to health care, you name it. Um, the graph to the right shows the issue of the carrying capacity of working older adults to those that are retired. And that's an issue in terms of paying for some of the social benefits like Social Security and Medicare and others that we, we hold so dear. So I think Maine is a great place to study aging. And I would encourage and invite all of you to join with our aging center in doing so. So I'm here in part because of this person. Uh, Cindy Taylor, a former trustee of our university, is president of Housing Initiatives of New England. And it was her gift through housing initiatives a couple of years ago that laid the financial foundation for the aging center. And I'll tell you, in academic gerontology today, to have a job where you actually have money you can spend and invest is just dynamite. So I'm, I'm very grateful to the university and particularly higher administration for trusting my judgment with this. So the aging center has a mission and our mission is to advance inclusive, narrative-informed, and outcome-oriented research on healthful aging. I like the term inclusive more than I like the term interprofessional. Interprofessional is a great term, but I, I think we're more than that in terms of the work we do in aging or should be. It's not just the interchange of professionals, but it's actually the exchange with the community and the people who we're actually studying about and with. I think we can benefit from many different perspectives. Narrative informed comes in because I believe that qualitative or narrative input has value even in the most quantitative of studies. Because ultimately we do research translate back to the human condition to make people's lives better. And knowing the context of people's lives, their values, their beliefs informs research and allows for translation. So I'm a mixed methods guy. I like the intersection of qualitative and quantitative. Outcome-oriented research, I think we're more of an applied research center. Of course, we're, we're growing and developing, but we want to make a difference in the lives of people. I don't see us as much being involved in studying the basic mechanisms and etiology of disease. Others on our campus and across the country are doing that. I think we as an institution can make a difference with respect to quality of life, helping people age in place successfully, but also helping people make those later life transitions that we all make on the pathway to the ultimate end point, and that's death. 
So I'm going to share with you about the Legacy Scholars in a moment. A lot of my first year has been building partnerships. And um, I'll tell you, the welcome that our university has in southern Maine is really remarkable. Um, I come from a state of Missouri, where I spent the last 25 years before coming here. Missouri um, is a show me state. That's our motto. And it's kind of like, you got to show me, you got to prove yourself. And what I've been so pleased about with Maine is folks, I've heard all about, if you're not a Mainer, you're not welcome. That's not been my experience. I've been very welcome in every one of the meetings I've had. And I'll also tell you a little bit about the diagram to the right, which is our pillars for aging research. One of the resources we've developed early is a satellite office in a local 55-plus uh, independent living apartment building. Uh, those of you who have been up to the Portland campus may recall driving by a large brick and stone building with a gold dome or cupola. And that's the old St. Joseph's Convent, Sisters of Mercy Convent. It was built in 1906 and was recently repurposed as this 55 plus community. Much of the units are affordable or low income, but there are some market rate. And there are roughly 100 residents. So the idea of having a satellite office that we staff with student and some regular paid staff time, it provides us an opportunity to recruit residents for research, but also to provide an educational setting and the opportunity to try out new ideas, um, pilot research. So for example, we're looking at doing uh, a nutrition project focused on the nutritional needs of older adults that do not have personal transportation that rely on public transit, which is many of the individuals in this building. And uh, we're working with the Center for Excellence in Public Health on that right now. So I like to think, I don't, when I visit with folks at the Mother House, I don't call them a living laboratory, by the way. Um, that might upset them. Um, but that's how I'm thinking about it. It's a building that was not designed for senior housing. It was designed for nuns to be alone and to be contemplative. And so the physical plant of the building does not lend itself necessarily to socialization. And there are some other issues, for example, with respect to fall risk. So it's a very interesting building to do, particularly mixed methods studies around the lived experience of people in this type of, of senior housing. So the center strategy for success has been, uh, well, rather short term at the moment. I'm starting to think a little bit longer term. But year one was really to grow an infrastructure uh, for applied work and to develop partnerships and to seed projects around the university, some of which I'll be sharing with you over the course of this presentation. Now that we're in year two, we're shifting from developing the infrastructure to actually using it. And that's a big reason for today's talk. We have a call for pilots, which I'll talk about. And we really need to start now developing a track record of external funding in applied research and aging. And you'll hear about that as well. So one of the things that I did early in my time here uh, with some input from colleagues is kind of vision what is our research agenda for UNE. If you look at university-based aging centers across the United States today, I will tell you they're a dime a dozen. They're everywhere, everywhere. Every university of it worth its salt wants an aging center, which is great. But how does UNE define its place in the midst of all of these other aging centers? I think we do it through thinking outside the box. Um, so we, we typically think of academic research in the disciplinary silos of the academy. And I've, I've tried to turn that a little bit on its head and think, well, what are the disciplinary pillars or the thematic pillars that are important in healthful aging in community and aging in place? And so the seven pillars on the slide, if you can read them, the first is identity. Well, identity is not just male and female, young and old. Uh, an area of, of tremendous promise for research right now is LGBTQ aging. We're way behind in under, understanding issues of that diverse community. Um, so studying different aging identities is one. Another is function. So I could, have I could have written health there or medical, but I'm thinking more in terms of the intersection between health and how we actually function in our homes and community. The third is transitions. Life transitions happen 
for all of us all the time. Some are scripted and expected, like graduating from medical school, right? Some are uh, uh, very individualized. The ultimate transition is the transition to death. Uh, and end of life transitions I'm particularly interested in. I don't think they get studied enough. So the third pillar is transitions. The fourth is generations. I'm really interested in intergenerational work in aging. I think there's a lot of potential. I'm going to share with you one piece of research that we've just completed with an intergenerational focus. The, the, uh, the next is practice. Practice, what are the best practices? What are evidence-based practices to do the best uh, for older adults and with older adults? The last two are economics and environments. So uh, I'll tell you, money is important in our world, and how you pay for things is critical. And, then, and the environments really leans heavily to the mother house. At least that's one of the areas where we can study environment. So I have a flyer that actually uh, gives examples of research ideas and how to link them across these pillars. And the call for proposals that we have out for faculty projects for next academic year encourage faculty to think across these different pillars. Not within one's own discipline, but think about engaging others at the university to support uh, a research question that is applied and matters for people. And I do have a stack of paper copies right up here. So anybody who is interested or you want to take one back to your professor if you're a student, feel free. So the other thing that we created very early on last year is the Legacy Scholars Program. It's based upon the notion that older adults want to give back. That just because you're older doesn't mean you don't have a, a lot to give. And in fact, arguably, you have a, a, a wealth of wisdom and learned experience that is really critical to give, <clears throat> to give back. Excuse me. I'm glad you brought me water, Diane. It's also based on the idea that fellowship is important, staying connected. And so there's a picture here from our coffee event. We do a coffee event with our legacy scholars every other month. This was last month in uh, Saco at the Ferry Beach Retreat Center, a really cool um, retreat center right on the ocean. And we had a, sp a speaker from the Alzheimer's Association, Peter Baker, share about the 10 warning signs of Alzheimer's with the group. It was really interesting, very stimulating. Our next event is going to take place on the 13th of December, and it's a coffee actually built around understanding the history of the Mother House building. And we'll actually do that uh, you know, on that property with tours, architectural tours of the building. So I'm really excited about that. The Legacy Scholars does three things. Number one, first and foremost, it's a participant recruitment resource and registry. It's a people resource. So if you're a student researcher or a faculty researcher and you want to collect data from real people, I'm here to help you. And I'll give you some examples of the early success we've had in this area. Number two, it's a longitudinal study of healthful aging. I'm going to share some of the data we have with you in a moment. It's not a deep dive into any particular area of aging. There's so much we could cover, and we don't want to burden our participants with too long of an annual survey. But the annual survey has enough, enough depth that it can support research, particularly student research. And already, I've actually been doing some research with the data, and it's been quite fun. So the Legacy Scholars is a data resource, particularly for students. And this is tied to the university's strategic plan. Finally, it's a dissemination and lifelong learning program. Many universities make the mistake of forming research registries. Sign up, we'll call you when we need you. They're not good for retention. People drop off if they're not, if they're not part of the family, if they're not kept engaged. <clears throat> and so what we're all about with Legacy Scholars is letting our, our group know what's going on, keeping them abreast, engaging with regular events. It builds a sense of shared mission. And it also um, ensures that people stay with us, that they are committed to our cause. So far, so good. The model is working. So early recruitment for Legacy Scholars has focused pretty much around our two campuses uh, here in southern Maine. 
Our alumni office was really terrific in sending out a couple of blast emails to our alumni, figuring that they would believe in the mission and join, and they have. Done a lot of community presentations. I, I, spoke, with, I spoke, gave a Rotary Club, Club talk yesterday, in fact. Lots of word of mouth. There have been many of our legacy scholars have been telling their friends and neighbors, and that's been terrific. We created a community liaison position. Um, some of you might know Joe Wolfberg. Uh, Joe's a, uh, a mainstay on the Portland campus in the PA program. He now works part time for me doing some community building and community outreach. And we've developed many key partnerships across the state. So the Maine Council on Aging, for example, has sent a blast email to all of their members statewide about our Legacy Scholars Program, which has been really quite exciting. So who are the Legacy Scholars? Um, I'm going to share with you a couple of case studies that are drawn from our annual survey. And then we'll delve into actually some of the, the specific data. Um, but this is a great picture. These, these, these are two of our current legacy scholars at an art and aging workshop that we held last winter that was extremely well received. We did that in concert with social work. So Martha Jones, this is not a real name or a real picture. I just, I think it helps to have a name and a, and a picture. But Martha, as you can see, she's 86. She's educated. She's retired. She's economically secure. Uh, lives alone, still drives, but she is using now a walker to get around. She, she really cares about her, her health, tries to take care of herself as best she can. She eats well. She strives to get enough sleep. She, she's continuing to push herself, and I think this, this is uh, very true of many or most of our legacy scholars. She's seeing some differences. As she's, as she's gotten older, she's more withdrawn and reflective. Um, she still volunteers her time, but her energy is not what it used to be. Um, she feels loved by those near her, and she has a support network, which is terrific. But as she looks back, she recognizes that her life has been shaped by some trauma and abuse experiences and some serious illnesses, including cancer and stroke. Uh, she has some chronic pain right now. She recognizes that her health is declining, and you know, she's worried about forgetfulness. Um, in her responses, she acknowledged significant forgetfulness. And that's, she's aware of it, but it's, it's a worrisome thing. Um, she's not hopeful about the future, to, if she's honest. And she's, she's kind of withdrawing and dropped some of her activities. Dying scares her. So this is somebody who's lived a very full life. She's vibrant. She's still working hard to be engaged. But some of the challenges of this final life transition period old age to death are weighing on her. There's think, there, I think there's a lot that someone like Martha can teach us. And she's engaged with us as a legacy scholar. Monica Simpson, she's 65. And um, she's in a different place in life. Um, similarly well-educated and financial, financially secure, um, she enjoys a high level of health and function, mostly. But she's starting to notice some things that concern her. Her sleep is not what she'd like it to be. And she's seeing decline in her health and function, just the very beginning. She's noticing forgetfulness. And she's got some mild chronic pain that's a nuisance to her. On the other hand, she works hard to maintain a positive outlook. And she's got the network and supports uh, around her to help her when times do get tough. She's a present caregiver. I believe, for her spouse. And, and this, is a, this is another aspect of challenge. So many of our legacy scholars are active, engaged adults. And as I share with you the demographics of the sample, you'll see, you'll see both Monica and uh, Martha in that data. Again, those are not real names. So how does the Legacy Scholars Program work? So if you look at the gray arrow on the left, that's the entry point. You join the research registry. You pick up the, the colorful flyer, or you, you sign up online. You're sent a link to do an annual survey that takes 30-ish minutes, depending upon how fast you are with a computer. Or we will send it to you on paper. About 15% of our respondents choose paper, and that's fine. 
Next, once the data is in the clearinghouse, and it's, we're actually IRB approved as a clearinghouse, which is a little different than simply a study, in the sense that when I work with a faculty member or a student with an approved IRB project, there can be crosstalk between the clearinghouse and that project, um, which is helpful. So I can provide data from the annual survey to enrich the project, um, provide data that then the investigator doesn't have to collect because I already have it. So it's a really, it's a nice setup. We have a, a community advisory board that includes both participants, people who are actually on our Legacy Scholars panel, as well as community professionals and researchers. And we're set up now to support both new projects that use existing data. I'll share some ideas about what you might study in a moment but also new projects that would collect new data using our cohort and our volunteers. Um, we're moving to actually developing interprofessional teams, hopefully students in this room perhaps, that will go into the homes of some of our legacy scholars and do much more advanced evaluation. So the survey is self-report. There's a real benefit to collecting direct data from people and we're, we're certainly thinking about that. Any questions about how it works before I continue? Okay. So our, I mentioned our annual survey is not a deep dive. It covers um, a broad range of issues. I'm a psychologist, so it certainly has my stamp on it. Um, uh, I actually think asking questions about existential issues in life is really important. Um, However, there's enough depth in the annual survey that we can begin to address specific research questions to it, which is very exciting. It's also growing large enough now, um, and as we begin to do it each year, we're gonna have a really nice throughput of data to support student projects. So here's the current sample. We have 384 as of last, about a week ago. I'll let you digest it for a minute. Um, the fact that we have 27% men is a really good thing in this age of population. Um, so I'm not bothered by the fact that we're mostly women. 27% um, is very good. Um, this is largely a very healthy group. So the mean number of medications prescribed and taken by a physician is under five. Um, however, if, if the mean is five, you know we've got some people taking 10 or more and polypharmacy is a potential issue in this sample and something that can be studied. I've got arrows by a couple of the metrics. Right now, our rural um, representation in the sample is well below the state of Maine. That's an issue. We're needing to expand our recruitment north and down east to be able to rectify that. And we're, we're starting to work on it. I will tell you that the easy part was the people that know us. The harder part is getting out into the world. Um, people that may not know you any well, um, but may still be willing to join with us. The other arrow um, is next to, um, actually the other arrow is not next, it should be next to education, that's my mistake, not next to age. Our age is great, and I'll show you the distribution in a moment. Our mean education is not good for a research center's cohort. Anyone wanna guess why? Why is the education level not a good thing? It's really high. It's really high. And I think it speaks to our early adopters. Since we recruited a lot of our early people through our own alumni, their base level of education is at least an undergrad degree. Um, the notion of being a legacy scholar, I think, speaks to education. And so there is the, a certain identity issue of joining the program. So we're starting to think about ways that we can appeal to persons with less education. And that's actually a project potentially in itself. Let me, let me stay over here. You'll notice even though our sample actually is very healthy overall, folks are reporting different concerns. Um, so almost half of the sample report forgetfulness uh, to some extent. And you'll see some of the other conditions. Um, so that's, uh, it's hard to avoid having some health conditions as one gets older, of course. Here's our age distribution. So for a 
uh, a sample of community dwelling or any, any attempted representative sample, you want to see the normal curve. And we've got it, very exciting. We have a nice distribution of age around a mean of just shy of 72. In terms of our gender composition, um, we are now recruiting into the 50s, but we have only a small footprint. And so um, most of our folks are 60 and older. But you'll see the general pattern of, of men. We do have men in each of the age bands, 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, proportionally, a little bit more women uh, in the uh, 70 to 79 range. Built into the annual survey are different ways that people can tell us about themselves. We have uh, roughly 40 items or statements where you respond on what's called a Likert scale, a one to seven disagree to agree. And these are st uh, percentages derived from people slightly agree and above for each of these items. It's just a way to know people, but it's also a way to track change in perception over time. So if somebody is saying, I sleep well most nights, um, and they strongly agree one year, and it's dropped to disagree the next, that's something we want to pay attention to. The other reason for these kind of statements is they provide a springboard for hypothesis generation, for thinking about something that's interesting in terms of a pattern. So of those 13% that dislike keeping track of their medications, is it because they're on a large number? Is it because they have a lot of comorbid conditions? Is it because they're concerned about forgetfulness? So you can begin to take that one idea and then spread it out in your exploration of the potential issues. So before coming to UNE, I did some work around legacy beliefs in aging. So we all leave a legacy when we, uh, when we die. Some of those legacies we know and expect, some we will never know. Um, and um, I included this statement out of curiosity to see what sort of the legacy interests may be within this population. Are people concerned about how they'll be remembered or do they hope to be remembered? And this is a potential for research. So at the Gerontological Society of America conference, uh, last fall, so my first fall here at UNE, I presented this poster um, about the work on legacy beliefs and the need to develop a clinical measure, or my interest in developing a clinical measure of legacy beliefs. I think understanding personal legacy is actually really important for people in hospice and palliative care on the cusp of death. So we have an opportunity to harness the Legacy Scholars Program to continue this work, and I'm looking for potential partners to work with me. The survey also includes items that we, I call them about me items. These are statements that you can say applies to me now, applied to me in the past, or never applied to me. Again, it's a way to kind of mix up learning about the respondent with also a way to track change over time or potential change. So I've given, and they, they range from illnesses to functional to, um, uh, to kind of roles. So I've put four up here. And you'll see, so the top, it's hard to see, but the top line would be applied to me now. So we have a, a, a reasonable number of current caregivers and quite a few foreign, uh, former caregivers in our sample. Um, I'm interested in, in, driving, in, in driving fitness in aging and the use of alternate transportation. And we have not a large number of people using alternate trans transportation, but we have some. And this is in, I threw that in because I want to be able to look at that in the future. A lot of this sample say that they are current mentors to others or they did so in the past. So right now we're in the process of programming into RIDCAP and doing an IRB application for a supplemental survey. Current survey takes about 30 minutes upon entry. And we've been toying with the idea of expanding that survey or not. And I'm leaning toward the or not. Talk to a number of our legacy scholars and other advisors about expanding the, the ent entry survey. And the issue is one of burden. And we don't want to burden people. And we want to appeal to people who are lower education. We need to be real careful. So we're working right now to create a, a, a detailed medical and medication history supplemental survey that will go out early in the new year to all of our members in the hopes that most will do it. And I think most will based upon the experience I've had with them so far. 
this is targeted specifically to people in this room because for the med students, we need to have a little bit better medical history on this sample. So the clinical measures built into the current survey include the 15-item geriatric depression scale, the eight-item Penn State worry questionnaire, which is a measure of generalized anxiety, very common issue uh, in aging, the AD8, which is a self, in this case, it's a self-report uh, cognitive scale that is reasonably sensitive and specific to the onset of dementia. And then the last scale is actually a scale of mine. It's a tool looking at readiness to transition from driving to non-driving status. So if you live into your, into your 70s and certainly into your 80s, you're going to have to retire from driving. It's just the way it is with changes in health and function. Self-driving cars might solve that, but I'm not holding my breath. So GDS, most of our folks are not reporting depression. We have a, currently our sample is very healthy and um, doing very well in terms of mental health. Um, right now, 22 individuals, if you score the GDS the traditional way, which is a yes-no scale, so it's a forced choice, 22 individuals are in the at-risk range for depression. However, something we did, and it was a research question I had, what if we, and I've always wanted to do this, and I finally had the opportunity, what if I put a maybe in there and make it a three-level questionnaire? Many older adults, when they are um, filling out, not many, but enough, when they fill out the GDS, hate the forced choice and will leave the item blank instead of responding. I figure, let's give them a maybe and see what they do. Well, what's very interesting, when we give them the maybe and we score the maybe as a yes, now the numbers of people screening positive for depression in our sample doubles. So there's an opportunity here for an existing data research project to take this and look for correlates, try to expand the context and understand how this alternate form of scoring the GDS might be worthwhile in research. This is the Penn State Worry Questionnaire Distribution. Again, we don't have a lot of people with anxiety worry issues in this sample, hence the skew to the left. But the cut score is 23 points, and we've got 51 individuals who are showing um, or at least reporting significant anxiety worry. Um, another opportunity for study. It's really interesting when you cross-tabulate those above and below the cutoff on the Penn State Worry Questionnaire and the GDS, you, you don't get a, a perfect concordance. Only th 13 individuals are actually both depressed and anxious in our sample. We have quite a few, 38 individuals who are above the cutoff for anxiety. This is another potential area for research, looking at the distinctions between anxiety and depression, both in our existing data, but we could also do some targeted new data collection by surveying these older adults uh, around these issues. This is the AD8. So the AD8 is um, also skewed heavily to the left because most of the people in our sample are not reporting cognitive change, but there are some. A score of two or higher on the AD8 is suggestive of possible dementia. And um, we're not sure what this means in the present sample, in, in part because we've been recruiting only high-functioning community-dwelling elders so far. So why are some, one of five right now, saying on this scale, acknowledging risk for dementia? It could be they don't understand the scale. It could be something to do with their personality style. Yeah, there's a question. Use the microphone. So if you press, push your, hold down on the microphone button. The term dementia, are you referring to mild cognitive impairment? Or can you, can you elaborate on the term? So um, we think about dementia as an umbrella term. Um, if you think about a dementia spectrum, we typically think about mild cognitive impairment or mild neurocognitive disorder is at the far left just after normal and we can go all the way up to severe dementia. The number one cause of dementia is Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease accounts for seven of 10 dementias, although there are many mixed dementias built into that as well. So when I say dementia, I'm talking globally right now. In this case, I don't know what these data mean, so I'm not gonna label it further. 
So, um, oops, let me skip that. So what we're, what we're looking at, um, there's a grant application I'm going to tell you about a little bit later in more depth if I have time. We're looking at um, developing student teams to go into the homes of those who screen positive on the ADA and do involved neurocognitive testing along with some other evaluation of function to find out what's actually going on. Um, so that, that's another opportunity for students to engage with the aging center. This is my scale um, that uh, the assessment of readiness for mobility transition short form. There's a longer version. Um, this is a scale that I've not done a ton of research on, but I'm wanting to get back into. I uh, put it on hold for the last couple of years. Um, but we have that nice normal distribution, which is really interesting. Um, and the idea of the scale, would it, be, it would be predictive of persons that would struggle to give up the keys. You probably all have stories or no stories of people that refuse to retire from driving, even though they're well past the point of safety. The idea of the scale is to help kind of understand the psychology of those individuals. So this is another opportunity. We've built into the, into the annual survey the five-factor model of personality. Um, some of you who took psychology as undergrads, you'll know about this. It's five superordinate or primary factors that break out adult personality, and these are listed with the dimensions on the screen. So neuroticism is very closely tied to persons who have anxiety and depression at the high end, because persons who are highly neurotic tend to be emotionally unstable and, and very reactive people. And you can read down the slide. There is a growing literature linking personality to health behavior and health outcome. This is an area ripe for new research. Um, and I think it's an area where our aging center can make a significant contribution. These are the five personality domains or factors. I know they're hard to read. But as you look at the distribution, so the, 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 um, in the center, it's conscientiousness. The lower right corner is agreeableness. Uh, upper left corner, neuroticism, openness to experience, lower left, and extroversion, upper right. As you look at these distributions of response, do you notice anything? Does anything jump out that maybe tells you something about our sample? or maybe tells you something about the two case studies I shared earlier. Okay, what do you see? Look for the skew hint. Where's the skew the greatest? Say it loud. Agreeableness. Go figure. These are volunteers for a program like we I've described. These are, these are nice people. They're agreeable. Um, so we have this high in agreeableness. The other biggest skew is conscientiousness in the center. These are people that are willing to get their hands dirty and help out. They're conscientious. They're agreeable, they're conscientious, so it's, it's reflected. So we don't have the full range of human personality. In a, in a typical large personality study, you would see a normal curve for all of these. So we also are a little different and perhaps not generalizable in the sense that of the, the characteristics of those who self-select for our project. The skew and agreeableness and conscientiousness got me to wonder, is there a personality relationship to the people screening positive for cognitive change that I just shared? And this is the poster about that project that we presented at the Gerontological Society of America last week. Um, I'm going to show you a couple pieces of it in a minute. Um, I'll just jump to it. So um, I'll leave that out for a minute. So what I did, um, and this is a, a work in progress. I got some really good feedback at my poster that I'm not ready for publication on this yet. I need a, a larger sample. But basically, we took the people who scored zero on the 88, the to people who were saying they were cognitively normal, and we took the people scoring in the clinical range, two or above, and we put them into a data set and we ran a logistic regression where the dependent variable was normal cognition versus potential dementia. And we used age as the one covariate because, of course, age is the number one risk factor for dementia in terms of demographics. And we put the five different uh, personality characteristics in. 
And the little colorful graph to the right is my way of showing this. So no, no surprise, advancing age, higher age predicted persons scoring positive for cognitive change. Neuroticism, high neuroticism, predictive cognitive change. Lots of studies have shown that. Look at the next one, agreeableness. There are, there are only like two published studies out there that have shown an agreeableness relationship to reports of cognitive change. And this is, this is something unusual in terms of the general literature, but perhaps it's not unusual for our sample. So that's why I want to run it with a much larger sample and see what happens. Um, conscientiousness and openness to experience go in the other direction. So if you're low in conscientiousness, you're low in openness, you're kind of closed and rigid, you're more likely to report cognitive change. So this is an example, a very simple example, of how you can use this five-factor model of personality to understand different aspects of, of health and aging. There is perhaps a relationship between the five-factor model and cardiovascular disease. I haven't studied the literature enough, but my brain is telling me there is. So those of you that might be interested in that might be something to look at. I'm going to skip this for time. So the options for utilizing our resource. Number one, you can work with us to obtain a de-identified data set from our annual survey around your question of interest. Of course, your question of interest has to fit with what we collect. So the first step is to interact with me and my team so I know what you need and what you want. The second way would be to conduct new data collection and, and benefit from the clearinghouse approval we have for the legacy scholars, that permeability. So that I can give you data from the annual survey, but you can collect new data from individuals. So the work we're going to do, hopefully if it gets funded, while we're going to the homes of these individuals with cognitive impairment, is going to be of the second type. We're going to use data we already have, but we're going to collect new directly from them. And then the third way is to actually come up with a whole new research study where you want to recruit fresh from our resource. All three, of course, are, would require IRB, IRB approval and some, some significant planning, but, but we're here to help with that. These are some examples of some of the studies that have recruited with us now or are recruiting um, recently. So Dr. Katie Rudolph um, it, it runs our motion analysis lab in Portland. If you've not gone and visited it, it do so. It's really cool. Um, I'd, I'd like to hang out there for a while if I could. Um, she's studying the impact of knee pain on daily life function. And is there a way that you can change how a person moves and gets around to lessen the pain to improve function? We've been able to recruit almost 100 people for the Got Knees study. In fact, Katie told me, don't do any more recruitment, please. We've, we've got a backlog. I mean, that's great news. Um, on the far left, this is a daily diary study. So Dr. Julie Peterson in psychology, she had never done research with older adults. She developed a daily diary study to understand emotional modulation and relationship quality over time. So she had the method that with young people, and she's now applied the same method to older adults. And the first poster from this project was just accepted to a national meeting in psychology. Really cool. The middle one is a study that's currently going, still needing recruits. Um, there are a few of my legacy scholars in the room. I'm not going to point you out because that would be an IRB violation. But um, you've gotten this flyer from me more than once. Um, and this is a study looking at reading and comprehension and memory by paper versus e-reader. And it happens in a lab into Carey Hall. Other supported studies run the gamut, and because my time is short, I'm not going to spend much time with these, except I'm going to, to mention one. So this is a study through our public health, our online public health program, looking at older adults' understandings of ageism, so like sexism or racism, ageism is making negative judgments and treating people differently based on their age or a perception of age. And we um, looked at the relationship to public health or perceptions of ageism as a threat to public health. And, oh, it's not there. Okay. Um, 
the poster that I thought I was going to put next isn't there. So we also just presented Diana, uh, Diana Mayo. Some of you know Diana Mayo from the med school, I believe. Uh, Diana, I don't, actually I can't remember Diana's title. But Diana works full time in the med school. She's also an MPH student online. And she's an academic coordinator. Thank you. So Diana, as part of her Master of Public Health, did a study, and I helped, and others did, looking at the perceptions of baby boomers of ageism as a threat to public health versus silent generation. So persons in their 60s versus persons in their 80s. And I was going to tell, show you on the poster some of the data, but I'll just give you the punchline. So they all agreed it's a threat to public health. We asked them which persons younger than you or older than you are more likely to be impacted by ageism. The boomers thought the silent generation were much more impacted. They said, well, these are people who are older, more likely to have trouble with frailty and advancing disease, risk of long-term care. So we interviewed the folks in their 80s, and we asked the same question. Oh, no, we're not affected. It's the young people that are affected. It's the boomers. And their argument was boomers still have to earn a living, and they're going to be discriminated against in the world of work. And sure enough, we heard many examples about age discrimination at work in the boomer group, even though they didn't think it was that significant. So we're moving now toward uh, writing that up for publication. Other data sources. So the Legacy Scholars data set is insufficient for deep research in aging. It's just not gonna, it's not gonna do it. And so I've developed two relationships, one with the main Syracuse Longitudinal Study that's based at UMaine Orno, and one with what's called the NKI Rockland Longitudinal Study. And I'm gonna move, um, am I officially ending at one or can I run over, Carol? <laughs> All right, I might run over a few, and if anyone has to leave, I understand. So the main Syracuse Longitudinal Study of Aging is a really cool data set. It is available for use by others, and it's, it's actually underutilized. Um, it's designed to do research particularly around cardiovascular disease and cognition. It includes personality, so the five-factor model. And it has a lot on lifestyle, uh, including nutrition. And you can see they even are collecting APOE genotype, E4 genotype, which is very interesting if you do work on Alzheimer's disease, because that's the one genetic risk that we know for Alzheimer's disease, that if you are the carrier, you are much more likely to have the disease. So um, this is the PI. His name is uh, Merrill or Pete Elias. He goes by Pete. Uh, he's 81 and proud to tell it. I was just with him and he was very proud to tell it and still a very active researcher. The main Syracuse data set had its last wave of data collection in 2006, but it has five publications from that in the last three years. So they're still actively working with these data and there's a tremendous potential to work with these data more. So I'm in the process of becoming an approved investigator to access the data and to link it for student and faculty projects. So if, you're, if anybody is really jazzed about learning about this and wants to go on a road trip, hopefully it's not snowing. On the 8th of January, I'm driving with a group up to actually have a, a second formal meeting with the main Syracuse group about, uh, about um, utilizing their data. And there probably will be some kind of MOU that will come to the leadership that will stem from this eventually. The other data set is the Nathan Klein Institute Rockland sample. Um, it, it is a um, really interesting uh, sample across the whole lifespan, but I'm particularly interested in the latter half in Rockland County, New York. Uh, the aims of the Rockland sample you can see here, they're really wanting to understand um, particularly neurocognitive functions. This is a heavy neuroscience data set. Um, it's also really heavy on mental health and psychiatric issues. Uh, according to my talks with the investigators, they argue they have the most representative longitudinal study in the country. We'll see if that's true. Um, they do extensive neurocognitive testing, clinical interviewing, questionnaires, Physical me measurement, they do MRI. They also do a genetics panel. 
So it's a very rich data set. Um, you can see this is the age distribution of the sample, and, and roughly half are over the age of 45. So um, it actually could be a, a resource once we're in it, and I'm also now approved, but I'm still learning their, their data portal, which is complicated as heck. If anybody is really tech savvy and wants to help me, I'd love it. Um, so it could be pediatric research as well, because they go all the way down to age six. This is the list of measures. I know you can't read it, but I'll, it's available on their website. Um, it's, a psych, it's a neuropsychologist's dream, the research they do and the measures they collect. There's ways you can parse memory and attention 10 different ways based upon what they collect. They have a really strong um, team that's behind it, and they're all about collaboration. So an official MOU signed by the president is now in place, so we have the ability to interface with this data set. We would still run projects through our own IRB as existing data projects, but we don't have to go to the Air their IRB for this. We can keep it within UNE. What's really interesting on this team is one of my former students. So Anna McKay Brandt, I taught when I was at Washington University School of Medicine many years ago. And I was at a conference uh, this summer, and uh, she came up to me and said, Tom! And that's how this connection began. She began telling me what she was doing and said, you know, we have great data no one's using. And I've been all over it since. So engaging with the Aging Center, how are you going to engage with us, the Legacy Scholars, the Rockland, as well as the main Syracuse? So one way I'm going to pilot next semester a research team that will meet here on the Biddeford campus most Fridays from 4 to 4.30. I have to find a room, certainly open to suggestions on a, on a good room where that might be. Um, we'll have food. Can't have a meeting at the end of the day on a Friday without food. Um, um, faculty, and Carol I've already roped into this, and she's actually volunteered. Faculty are welcome to come both to be, to engage with us for research, but also to be co-mentors with me. I could use some help, particularly those who have experience in study design and statistics would be, would be terrific. But the invitation is anybody who wants to engage with our resources, we're going to have an open drop-in research team, so you don't have to come to every every week, but if you have a specific idea of a study you want to take from start to finish, we'll work with you. If you want to join and piggyback on other work and just help with the study, we'll work with you. So, um, and at the end of the semester, I'm going to see how it goes in terms of engagement, and we'll, we'll see about codifying this as a standard offering in the center for next academic year. Coming soon, we're going to create an online portal in fact, I created a paper survey uh, to hand out today around research, but it's not, not quite ready um, for um, reasons I won't go into. But my plan is to create an online portal where you can tell me about yourself and your interests, and you can sign up for different potential engagement. So that will be coming soon. I would hope to have that ready by uh, before Christmas and sent out to everyone, so ahead of when we do the Friday events. So um, just some research news to close on. Many of you knew, know that we, in Portland, uh, had the good fortune of having the NIA directors uh, come here and share with us. The meeting was at USM on November 7th. And I know lots of good interest and energy are coming from that. In fact, I picked up a grant that I'm totally jazzed about applying for from, at that meeting. So um, I submitted an R15 grant, which is a grant Research grant that specifically targeting smaller institutions like ours, where student engagement in the research needs to be high. Uh, Stuart Goldman was, uh, Goldstein, sorry. I'm, I'm a little mentally tired, Stuart, I apologize. Um, was a tremendous help, and I'm grateful to his help. Um, what we're looking at with this grant, if it's awarded, it, we will develop a team where 10 students next academic year will engage in a mixed method study to understand what older adults believe about health span extension. And today's geroscience, which is saying we could intervene to change how people age and erase the frailty that many experience. 
So we're looking at that directly. This is an exciting project. This is the main Alzheimer's Disease Research Alliance. UNE is part of it, although putting us first in the list at the bottom is a little bit misleading. It's led by Jackson Labs. Um, this is a program project application that will go in in May. I am uh, the co-leader of, of Core 2, the Clinical and Community Outreach Core. The purpose of this program project grant is to look at cognitive aging, engaging older Mainers, to address three different topics. So number one, to test the hypothesis that gait change is an early symptom of Alzheimer's disease. Number two, to test the hypothesis that sleep disruption is an early symptom. And number three, to test that cerebrovascular damage is an early aspect of the Alzheimer's progression. Super cool stuff. If the grant is funded, I mean, our role is going to be a relatively modest. My role is going to be recruitment and engagement. And, and legacy scholars in the room, you'll hear more because we'll invite you to be part of it. Um, but this is a very exciting development. This is a level of collaboration that I would have not seen in Missouri where I came from, interinstitutional inter collaboration. I think this is a real sign of, of why Maine can and will be a leader in aging research. This is a project that I learned about when I was at the director's meeting. It's an R21, which is a planning or sort of initial groundwork kind of grant. And it's focused on lucidity and dementia. How many of you have interacted or know somebody who's interacted with somebody who is very objectively, very cognitively impaired, but they have a period of minutes or hours where they are their normal self again after long periods of not being their normal self? That's what lucidity is. Yeah, I've experienced it. There is a common story in hospice care about the rally, a period of time where a person who's near death suddenly seems to perk up and has a, a thrust of energy and excitement and interest. My, um, my wife's uncle had this right before he died. And this is a man who was the most gregarious storyteller ever. And he was able to be that man for a few hours before he died, which is just really cool. So believe it or not, there's hardly any study on what is lucidity in advanced dementia. How do you define it? What are the parameters? And very few NIA calls for research include mixed methods and qualitative. This one does. So we're going to go for it. Um, the application is also due in May. And um, so far, we, we're just in the early gathering of, of uh, articles and beginning to think about method. But one piece we think is really important is to collect a lot of narrative here, to actually interview people who've witnessed these moments of lucidity and get the real fine details of what they witnessed. This is a great opportunity for students to be interviewers for that project. Um, another one, so this is the project I mentioned before, the student teams that will evaluate those with cognitive impairment in their homes. So I submitted a letter of intent to the Northern New England Clinical and Translational Research Network. That letter of intent is shown. It was approved, which basically means now I got to write the full grant. Um, and it's due in January. And so, um, Stuart, I need to talk to you about that. Uh, <laughs> Fortunately, my letter of intent was almost a full grant application, so I'm in good shape. Um, if that's funded, it'll start next fall. And we will, we, our target is to do full in-home evaluations of 40 individuals showing signs of cognitive impairment. And I would like to anchor these teams with med students. So the med student would be the anchor with one or two students from other disciplines. And I'm open to undergrad or graduate. So that's coming as well. So how do you interact with us? Well, I'm going to be creating a portal where you can express interest. And I'll be getting that website address out through Carol and other people. In the meantime, you can, you can shoot me an email. If you're excited about something you've heard today, you have a question, um, shoot me an email. Reggie Robnett is the associate director. You can also email her. Um, if you are faculty and you want to apply for a pilot grant, I've got copies of our call up here. And um, I really appreciate your attention today. This has been great. So thank you. 
I'm going to stay for a few if there are questions or comments. Any questions or comments? I know some people have to leave. All right, thank you. Have a good day. Enjoy the sunshine. <laughs>